Good morning. Welcome to the assembly of the Lake Houston Church of Christ. It's time to begin our worship period, and we encourage you to join in with thankfulness and joy as we sing praises to our God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We'll begin this morning with the reading of a psalm and a prayer. Psalm 111 reads, Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord with, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work. His righteousness endures forever. He has called his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food to those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works and giving them the inheritance of the nations. His work, the works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Let's pray together. We praise you this morning, Father because you're worthy of all honor and glory. You are holy and pure and righteous, Father. There's no one as great as you. Father, please strengthen us with your spirit in the inward parts that Jesus may dwell in our hearts through faith. Help us to understand and know the love of Jesus that we may learn to love each other the way that you love us. Please bless our worship this morning to you and strengthen us, Father, that we may honor you in everything that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Our first song this morning is number 572, Send the Light. And if you're able, if you would join me in standing for this first song. There's a call comes ringing o'er the restless wave. Send the line, send the line. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the line, send the line, send the line. The blessed gospel light, let it shine. From shore to shore, send the line, the blessed gospel line, let it shine forevermore. We have heard the Macedonian call today, send the light, send the light. And a golden offering at the cross we lay. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. Let us pray that grace may everywhere abound. Send the light, send the light. And a Christ-like spirit everywhere be found. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The 
blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. Let us not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light. Let us gather jewels for a crown above. Send the light, send the light. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. Amen. You may be seated. Next song is number 500, O Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And after this song, we'll have a, a prayer for the offering. O Thou Fount of Every Blessing, tune my heart to sing Thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me ever to adore thee. May I still thy goodness prove. While the hope of endless glory fills my heart with joy and love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger Wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Never let me wander from thee, never leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O oh, Take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Good morning. Being creatures of habit, I want to remind everybody, because of our changes, that the contribution should be left out into the foyer. If you hadn't done that before worship, then be sure to do it after worship. And if you're joining us from home, Please stop by, pick up your communion packs and your self-addressed envelope and drop your contributions off that way. You know, one day we're going to get back to normal. Our things are going to change anyway, and some of us are going to continue to wear masks. Some will continue to social distance. Regardless of the changes, the change of the opportunity to give and the willingness to give to God will never change. Let us bow for the offering. Almighty God and Father, scriptures were just read, if we fear you, you will provide food. The countless blessings that you have sent to your children from the beginning of time until now, you have never let us down. Some of us may not be as blessed as well as some others, but there are things that those folks can do. 
that your children are capable of doing that reaches out far more than just others giving. Thank you for this opportunity. Let our hearts be desiring of what you need, what you want, knowing that what we give is minuscule to what you have provided. The church will continue without us. Christianity will grow. The spirituality is not because of us. It's because your faith and your grace and your blessings have never stopped providing for us. May we give back with a cheerful heart. It's the Son of Jesus we ask this prayer. Amen. Song before we'll have communion this morning is number 622. Tell me the story of Jesus. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious. Sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sing as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the highest. Peace and good tidings on earth. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious. Sweetest that ever was heard. Tell of the cross where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him. Tell how he liveth again. Love in that story so tender, clearer than ever I see. Stay, let me weep while you Love, pay the ransom for me. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious. We prepare for the communion this morning the few familiar passages I'd like to share with you that we might put our minds in, in thinking about what's been done for us so many years ago what still applies to our lives today first passage is a familiar one in 1st Corinthians chapter 11 you recall Paul recounting the events of the Lord's Supper and admonishing the church there in Corinth to follow them in verse 24 beginning he said and when he had given thanks, he broke it, meaning the bread, and said, This is my body, which is for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. In verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death 
until it comes. And that's what we're doing this morning as we partake of this communion, proclaiming our Lord's death until it comes. How important that death was, we can see from passages like Romans chapter 5. Paul, writing to the church there in verses 8 and 9, says, But God demonstrates his own love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Christ's death wasn't just important at one point in time. It's important to us today and how we live and helping us to live as God would have us. John says something similar in 1 John chapter 4. Looking at verses 9 and 10 there, John says, By this the love of God was manifest in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son, so that we might uh, live through him. And this, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So this morning, as we take this communion, let's recognize that there was but one lamb without spot or blemish to be offered for the sins of the world, and that he died for us freely while we were enemies, and that he is how we sustain our life with God this morning. Let's consider these things as we partake of this bread and through the vine. Did everybody pick up a communion pack this morning? If not, it would... If you would, go ahead and pull back the top layer of clear cellophane. Let's bow in prayer. Your gracious Heavenly Father, we bow before you. We thank you for Christ. We thank you for his will, his work, his death to satisfy you that we may have life eternal, that we might have a leader in this world, that we might have a teacher to show us the way. Thank you for the inspired word that we learn from, that we gauge our life off of. May we be more like he when we partake of this bread that represents his flesh that was beaten, battered, and torn for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Once again, if you'll peel back the next layer, we'll say a prayer for the cup. Almighty God and Father, you sent Jesus to the cross. You sent him as perfection to make worthy us through his blood when we're so unworthy. You justified us through his blood what more could we ask? What more could you give? You give us a way out of this world. If living for Jesus is so great, we can't even imagine what heaven might be like. If it's dirt roads and hot, it would be worth it for what you gave for us. May we partake of this fruit of the vine that represents the blood that flowed down so freely from the cross. We do this in Jesus' name. Amen.
packages have been left on the aisle for you to discard your cup in. Thank you. Song of invitation after the lesson will be 103, and the song before the lesson will be number 291, I Know Not Why, God's Wondrous Grace. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not what of good or ill may be reserved for me. Of weary ways or golden days before his face I see. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not when my Lord may come at night or noonday fair, nor if I'll walk the vale with him or meet him in the air. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 8. We'll be reading verses 31 through 36. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, you really are my disciples. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. We are descendants of Abraham, they answered him, and we have never been enslaved to anyone. How can you say you will become free. Jesus responded, I assure you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not remain in the household forever, but a son does remain forever. Therefore, if the son sets you free, you really will be free. Good morning, church. If you'll open your Bibles, please, we're going to be in the book of John, chapter 8. John, chapter 8, we'll be looking at those verses starting in verse 31. Out in West Texas, every, every uh, year they have what they call a mule race. If you've ever been to a mule race, it's very interesting. It's not like a horse race. You've heard the phrase, stubborn as a mule. Well, these men are all sitting on their mules at the starting line, and it's, it's out in West Texas, and they, they get on this uh, road headed out of town, and the race usually starts out pretty well. The fun part is watching how it ends. 
Some men, the winner usually comes in and his mule's doing well and he trots across the, the finish line. Everything's great and he wins the award. It's more fun watching the finishers who come in after that. Some of them are walking next to their mules. Some of them are pulling their mules while the mule pulls back against them. And some of them have given up completely. Some people get in their cars and go off to find their family member because they're nowhere near the finish line. The mules have a mind of their own. Even though their, their owners, their riders, want them to go in a certain direction, they dig in. Some of them will not go. They will not go the direction that they're supposed to go, that the master wants them to go. In these chapters we had in John for our Bible reading today, Jesus has a lot of conflict with the Jews and the Pharisees. And Jesus is trying to lead them to the finish line. He's trying to get them where they need to go. And if they were wise, where they would want to go. But they're as, as stubborn as mules. And we're going to look this morning at the fact that they, they didn't understand and they didn't believe and they didn't confess. And Jesus tells us why. The Bible tells us why they didn't do these things. In John chapter 8 and verse 31, I think it's important that we understand who's, who Jesus is dealing with. The Bible says Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, the Jews who believed in him. These are not atheists. These are not antichrists. These are not people who said, you know, you're not Jesus. These are Jews who believed in him. But he tells them, the truth will set you free. And they don't like that. They don't like that. They tell him, we've never been slaves to anyone. We're children of Abraham. And they fight back with him. And he tells them, no, you're doing the will of your father, the devil. And in verse 43, he tells them, why do you not understand? And he's going to give them the answer. Why do you not understand what I say? It's because you cannot bear to hear my word. You can't stand to hear my word. You don't understand a word that means to know or to perceive or to see clearly. Did they see themselves clearly? Jesus tried to help them see, you know, if you've, become a, if you've sinned, you've become a slave of sin. We're not enslaved. We've never been enslaved. Back in Luke chapter 18, Jesus told a parable. He says, to some who trusted in themselves, Luke 18 and verse 9, he told a parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Isn't this a problem in our world today? When people don't see themselves clearly, when they don't see themselves, when they only see their good qualities, and you look around and it's real easy to see other people's bad qualities. And if you don't see your own, if you don't see your own failures, your own shortcomings, your own sins, then you see yourself up here and everybody else down there and that's a problem. This man in the parable Jesus is talking about says two men went to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. Do you have that attitude? Ooh, thank you, God, that I'm not like those, uh, those other people. Thank you that I'm not like them. You know who them are, don't you? Them are the ones you don't like very much. Them are the ones that are different. I, I, God, thank you I'm not like them because they are bad. This Pharisee who stood up, he believed he was righteous, didn't he? That's the point of the parable. Those who trusted in their own righteousness... A man went up and prayed thus to himself, Thank you, God, that I'm not like other men. And then he begins to extol his own virtues about his giving and his praying and all the wonderful things that he does, his fasting, his tithing. In verse 13, But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You know, the Pharisee, I thank you, God, I'm not like other men. Have you ever been in one of those situations where the lighting is just right to make you look good? Maybe the lights are a little dim or, or you're, you know, I've heard people before and they'll say, I, I like that bathroom. It makes me look good. You know, it doesn't quite show all the details, kind of a hazy light. You know, I'm always learning from faith about different filters on pictures and things like that. And you can, you can filter things and you can make someone look a whole lot better than they all actually look. This is what this Pharisee, he had a filter. 
He had a filter where he looked at himself and all of the bad stuff got filtered out and he only saw the good things. I pray, I tithe, I fast. Look at all this good in me. What he needed was an unfiltered photo. And the tax collector who's standing on the corner, he, he strikes his breast and he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You know, the tax collectors and prostitutes had a great advantage. You know what it was? It wasn't financial. It wasn't knowledge. It wasn't righteousness. Do you know what their great advantage was? They knew who they were and there was no getting away from it. Man, when you were a tax collector, you knew you were a traitor. This is not a job you'd be proud of. You wouldn't, if you were a woman, you wouldn't say, Mom, I'm, I'm getting ready to marry a tax collector. If you were a man, you wouldn't come home and brag about marrying a prostitute. Everybody knew these were bad people. And they knew they were bad people because the good people reminded them of it very frequently. But even without that, they knew. It wasn't respectable to be a tax collector. It wasn't honor, honorable to be a prostitute. They knew who they were. It's like some members of the church, if you grew up and you were away from God and you were a, a, a very outwardly acting sinner and you become a Christian, you know who you were, you tell people who you were, there's no hiding from it. The danger sometimes is those who grew up in good families, good homes, that they've always known about God, they tried to do the right thing, you can have a filter on and think, you know, thank you God that I'm not like that member of the church. Because of that inability to see themselves, the Jews who had believed in him didn't understand. Jesus said, you didn't understand because you cannot bear to hear my word. You know, the translators have put in that word bear because it literally says you are not able. You don't have the power or the ability to hear my word. But the idea there in the context is that, that you, you don't want to hear it. Boy, it's become a, a meme part of our culture, our, our pop culture, to see Jack Nicholson saying, what about the truth? You can't handle the truth. You can't handle the truth. There's truth, but you can't bear it. You can't handle it. And here we have Jesus, and the idea is that he's trying to tell them the truth. They don't understand it. And Jesus says, the reason you don't understand it is because you can't hear it. He didn't mean that their ears weren't working. You know, the old cell phone commercials where the guy walks around and asks what? Can you, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? You know, this morning, you can hear the words I'm saying, but that doesn't mean that you hear what I'm saying. You think it's, you think it's likely that there's someone in here who is nodding their head thinking, yeah, I hope he's listening. I hope they're hearing what that preacher's saying because they need to learn that lesson. You might hear my words, but you may not be hearing my words. They didn't understand because they couldn't bear to hear. They didn't want to hear. They didn't want to see those things. And Jesus tells them why. He says in John chapter 8 and verse 44, You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. This is what you want. You can't, you can't hear. You can't understand the truth because you don't want to understand the truth. You want to do the will of your Father. You don't understand because you can't bear to hear what I'm saying. Have you ever had someone who loves you tell you something that was just hard to hear? Couldn't stand it, couldn't bear it. If you've been to the doctor and he gives you news, do you really want a doctor who comes in and tells you you're okay when you're not? No, you want the truth. The Bible says the time would come when they would not endure sound or healthy teaching. What did they want? They wanted teachers in accordance to their own desires. Tell me what I want to hear. Heather and I were talking about that story in the Old Testament where uh, the, the king is wanting to know whether he should do something. He says, is there anybody else? Yeah, there's one guy, but he never tells me anything good. Well, go get him. The prophet says something good. and He says, you're lying. Tell me the truth. Okay, I'll tell you the truth. See, I told you. I told you he always tells me something bad. You can't bear the truth. You can't handle the truth. And because of that, you don't understand. You don't know. You don't perceive. Is there a blessing in knowing the truth even if you don't like it? Is that good for us? You know, it's interesting to contrast in the Old Testament, David, when Nathan comes. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, Nathan has, has committed adultery with Bathsheba. He has arranged to have her husband killed. And the prophet Nathan, the Lord sends Nathan to David in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 1. 
And after Nathan tells him that story of the man who just had one little lamb and another wealthy man comes and kills it and, uh, or takes it away from him, David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who's done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, what? You are the man. That man deserves to die. David, get your filter off. You are that man. You're the one I'm talking about. Can you imagine in telling that story? If David had really seen himself clearly, he would have said, oh, I know where this is going. But instead he says, oh, that's awful. That man deserves to die. Now you compare that after David saw himself clearly. When you get to Psalm 51 and verse 3, David writes and prays to the Lord, For I know my transgressions, my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. David goes from he deserves to die to I deserve to die. When you see yourself clearly, there's a humility that comes with it. There's an understanding. There's an ability to go to God and ask for forgiveness. If you're sitting here this morning and you think you're so perfect and wonderful, how are you ever going to go to the throne of grace and mercy to find help in time of need when you don't think you need any help? Well, I'm not like those other people. Why would I need to go to God for forgiveness? David understood you know, we compare in Luke chapter 18 versus the, the man who stood up and prayed thus to himself, I, I'm thankful that I'm not like other men. The man who says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus says, this man, this man went down to his house. What does your Bible say? Justified. That's a religious word. You'll usually only hear that word at church, but I love old Avon Malone's definition. I'll never forget it. He said, young, young men and women, justified just as if I'd never sinned. To be justified, to be made right, to be made right just as if I'd never sinned. This man went home justified, this sinner who saw himself clearly. There's a blessing in hearing the truth about yourself and understanding it, even if it's hard to bear. Boy, that wasn't all in John chapter 8 and verse 45. Not only did they not understand, but they didn't believe. He says, but because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. To, to think something is true, to have faith in something. I've told you before about that book, Stella Luna, that I would read to the kids. And she's a bat. And she's hanging in the tree one night, and the birds come in, and they want to know why she's upside down. And she says, I'm not upside down, you're upside down. Right? Because when you're, when you're hanging by your feet, who's upside down? The birds that are sitting upright and, 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 there, and vice versa. And so when the Pharisees and the Jews who believed in Jesus, when he tells them the truth and they believe a lie, how does Jesus appear to them? He looks upside down. He says, you don't believe because I tell you the truth. And because they believed a lie... They were upside down. Isn't this difficult when you're trying to talk to someone and they have believed something untrue and you try to talk to them and tell them the truth? The truth seems like a lie to them because the lie is their truth. Isn't that difficult? Until they stop believing a lie, they will never believe the truth. If you were lied to growing up, if you were told that God didn't exist, if you were told that, that, that a baby could believe and, and, and become a Christian, if you were told something false... Until you understand that that's false, you won't believe the truth. Because you can't believe two opposite things to be true at the same time. You can't believe God exists and doesn't exist. You can't serve both God and money. You can't love the world and love God. You have to make a choice. They can't believe. They don't believe. Because what Jesus was telling them was the truth. They wanted to believe their father. Their will was to do the will of their father, the devil. And when the father is a liar and always lying to you, how do you reconcile that? You know, my kids have inherited my love for Calvin and Hobbes. And uh, one of the ones I remember is Calvin's always asking his dad's questions, and his dad doesn't always tell him the truth. Calvin says, Dad, how big is the sun? And he says, it's about the size of a quarter. 
and he, he holds a quarter up to see. And he asks him, why are old, old pictures and old TV shows in black and white? Well, color wasn't invented then. He says, I'm going to go ask mom. And he says, you do that. <laughs> Trying to get rid of him. But when your father, when you want to believe, and Calvin is skeptical and he doesn't always believe his dad, but what if you want to believe your dad? What if you want to believe your father? The Jews wanted to believe that they were righteous. Probably more than anything else. I want to believe that I'm good and right. I want to believe I'm better than other people. I know that's true of a lot of us as well. We want to believe that. We want to believe that we're righteous. We want to believe that we're good, especially when compared to other people. So it feels good to believe a lie. It feels good to believe that you're right and everyone else is wrong. It's comforting. It's reassuring. It doesn't mean it's true. You don't believe because I, I tell you the truth. He tells them also in chapter 10 and verse 26, again, he says, Jesus said in, in verse 25, I told you, they want to know, are you the Christ? Tell us plainly. And he says, I told you, and you do not believe. The words that I do in my Father's name, the works I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you don't believe because you're not of my flock. You're not part of my flock. It's always interesting when I meet your pet. Not my dog, not my cat, not my animal. But when I meet your pet, you know what? Because your pet doesn't respond to me the way it responds to you. I was over at someone's house this week and, and the, a dog came out and I reached down to pet it. And the owner was telling me, oh, you've got to be careful. You know, she could bite and here's where she's injured and, and different things like that. And that's her dog. And if she walks in, as she walked away, the dog followed her, not me. It's not my dog. It's not part of my pack. And that's very obvious. And to Jesus, it was very obvious. You don't believe because you're not part of my flock. He had just said in John chapter 10 and, and verse 3, I'm the good shepherd. He says, the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. When he's brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. If the Jews that believed in him were part of his flock, they would have believed him instead of the devil. But they didn't. Look, if you're so immersed in the world and in culture and in all of the sin of the world that you believe that, you're not going to believe the Father. If you believe that the world tells you, well, sexual moral, immorality is okay, if you believe that, you're not going to believe God when He says it's wrong and it'll cost you your soul. If you believe the world, you're not going to believe God because you're not part of His flock. If you are in the world, if you are following the world's ways, it's always going to seem to you like God is lying. Can you not see this in culture? Can you not see it in our world? That's not true. That can't be true because I've believed this. Jesus says you don't believe because you're not part of my flock. They didn't recognize his voice. They didn't hear his voice. They didn't listen to his voice. He says in verse 5, A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. You don't believe because you're not part of the flock. Is there a blessing in believing that truth? Jesus had told them the truth will set you free. Satan wants you to believe that God doesn't want you, doesn't love you, you're too far gone. There's a blessing in understanding that, yes, we are sinners, but we are also loved. We are also forgiven when we come to Christ for forgiveness. Finally, chapter 12. So we get a little further in John. Not only did they not understand because they couldn't bear to hear the truth, they didn't believe because he told them the truth and they weren't part of his flock, but in chapter 12 and verse 42... We actually see in verse 37, again, when Jesus said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still didn't believe in him. So many signs. And they still didn't believe. But when you drop down to verse 42, you see, nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so they wouldn't be put out of the synagogue. So some of the authorities believed, just like some of the Jews believed, but they wouldn't confess, and for, for what reason? So that they wouldn't be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the glory that comes from men more than the glory that comes from God.
You know, that word for confess is interesting. It just means same words. I mean, the same words. Say, to say the same thing, to confess. If Jesus says he's the Son of God, you say he's the Son of God. If you say you belong to him, he says you belong to him. It's this idea that you're saying there's no contradiction. I had two brothers one time who I was pretty sure were lying to me. So when I met them, I, I went to the, the place where they lived, and I said, hi, I said, it's good to meet you. I said, could you wait for me in this room real quick? And I took the other brother to a, another room, and I came, and I said, okay, I want to ask you some questions. And I took out a pad. They were very nervous. And I wrote down all of their answers. And then I went to the other brother, and I wrote down all of, of his answers. And it reminds me of the old story that I heard when I was just a, a teenager, the the professor who was teaching a class and the two boys come in and they said, we're sorry, we're, we're late for, for school. We had a flat tire. He said, okay, and he gave them the exam, but at the bottom of the exam it said, which tire? Okay. Got your story straight? Or are you going to say the same thing? This, we think of confessing, of uh, saying, oh, I'm sorry, I did it, I did it. And there's that aspect of confession, but, but here it's this idea of two people who say the same thing. They would not confess. They would not say, I belong to Jesus. I'm a follower of him. I'm a disciple of his. Why not? Well, it says because they were afraid of getting thrown out, but the real reason is because they loved the glory from men more than the glory that comes from God. Look, you have a choice to make. You can get praised now. I have a friend who has what he calls a love me wall. Where all of his plaques and awards, this is my love me wall. This is where I've received the praise of, of men. If that's most important to you, you're on a bad path. You know, Paul told some things to the churches that made them upset and angry. And he says, have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? Do you get upset? When people try to show you something about yourself or something that's true about yourself, would you rather not see it? You know, so many times in the Bible, they act like children. What do they do? They don't say, well, you know, I'm sorry, I have to respectfully disagree. They stick their fingers in their ears. I'm not listening. Like little children. They didn't understand because they couldn't bear to hear it. They didn't believe because it was the truth. And they didn't confess because the lo they loved the praise, the glory of men. Is there a blessing, though, in confessing, even if it cost us? Even if it cost us the synagogue? What if it cost you your job or your parents or your, your spouse? What if it cost you something? Is it worth it? Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32 Jesus said, so everyone who confesses or acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who's in heaven. But whoever desires me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Have you ever had someone vouch for you? I loved, I, I was trying to get into a building and I, I had worked my way through and I'd come in through a side door and I, was, I, I belonged there, I just, I didn't have the, the ID I needed to get in. And so I finally got where I was going and I got caught. And I shouldn't have been there coming in through that back door. If you, you, know, if you can't come in the front door, you shouldn't be there. And, and I, I was caught, and I'm just kind of stumbling about, around trying to, and all of a sudden, this, this high-ranking officer comes through. And he says, it's okay, he's with me. All of a sudden, I didn't have to have good ID. I, I was no longer in trouble at that moment. I'd been vouched for. He's with me. And I was, yes, I'm with him. The two of us are together. There's a blessing in confessing Christ, even if it costs you, even if men in this world don't like it, even if they think you're lying, even if they don't accept the truth. Jesus says, if you confess me, I'll confess you before the Father. If you belong to me, I belong to you. It's why we wear the name Christian and not the name of men. It's why we don't follow after priests and kings and popes. It's why we follow after Jesus Christ and call ourselves by his name. We belong to him. And we want him to belong to us. I feel sad for these Jews, just like Paul did. He said, my greatest desire, my heart's greatest desire is that they would know Christ, that they would, they would be like he was. They didn't want to hear it. When they heard it, they didn't want to believe it. And when they believed it, they weren't willing to confess it. Well, it makes it very hard to be a disciple of Christ, doesn't it? When you won't hear or believe or confess.
You know, when we offer the invitations, many times these are the same things that we stress, is that you don't just have to hear the words, you have to believe them. And when you believe them, it moves you to some kind of action when you realize, wow, I'm not great, I'm not saved, I'm a sinner. And because I'm a sinner, I need to do something about that. I need to change. And we repent, we turn, and then we confess, not just at our, our baptism, but also for the rest of our lives. We confess his name, we own him. But we, we don't jump straight to baptism. There, there has to be faith there. There has to be repentance there. There has to be belief there. There has to be that desire to follow after Christ. And when you're ready to die to yourself, then you're ready to be baptized into Christ. To say, no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. To hide yourself in Christ because you realize that your life at the throne of judgment is not going to get you to heaven. For those of us who are Christians, I think it's important we ask ourselves this question. Are we more interested in telling about our righteousness than hearing about our forgiveness? Do you see yourself through a filter that you need to remove? so that you will treat your fellow Christian differently? Do you see yourself as righteous and treat others with contempt? Sometimes your words show that you do. You don't want to walk in the footsteps of the Pharisee who prayed thus to himself and trusted in his own righteousness. You want to be like the man who is justified and say, have mercy on me, a sinner. Not him, a sinner but me, a sinner. If you need this morning to become a Christian and come to a gracious God, if you're willing to believe that you are lost without him and that you need him, that he died on the cross for you, that he wasn't just a prophet or a teacher or a good man, but he was the son of God in the flesh, then we can baptize you this morning. You can confess his name. You can turn from your sins and be saved. And if you're a Christian, be like Christ. Let there be a reason that you wear his name because you want to be like him. If you need to come this morning, we ask you to come while we stand and sing. Come to Jesus, he will save you Though your sins as crimson glow If you give your heart to Jesus He will make it white as snow. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to today. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come, come today. Come to Jesus, dying sinner, other Savior there is none. He will share with you his glory when your pilgrimage is done. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come today. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come, come today.